Thank you, Pastor Holmes. It's good to be in the Roman Colosseum. Amen. Minus the lions, I hope. Isn't God good? This is a great Brush Arbor meeting. Amen. We thank God for His goodness today. I love Joel, Nathan Holmes, the families, the wives, this church. Love all of you. Thank God for camp meeting. You glad you're here? Uh, it's good to be with God's people. Amen. And also, uh, in the turbulent times in which we live, it is uh, meetings like this. In fact, this one specifically has become and is at this point in time an important meeting for apostolic doctrine, apostolic identity, apostolic practice, apostolic lifestyle, apostolic fellowship. I'm glad for it all. How about you? Uh, yes. And I believe we're on to something. The more I look at this apostolic way, the more I believe it is the most exciting thing and core thing in the earth. And I'm accepting nothing with that statement. This is the most core thing in the earth. This is more core than D.C. This is more core than all the universities combined. This is more core than... The United Nations. I'm not saying that for effect. I'm saying that because I believe it. Amen. If you have your Bibles, let me read a scripture. And uh, if you want to follow along with me, it's in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Um, the Apostle Paul here is talking about this Pentecostal way. And he tells him in verse 4, And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Howbeit we speak wisdom among them that are perfect, Yet not the wisdom of this world, nor the princes of this world, that come to naught. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery. Even the wisdom, hidden wisdom, which God ordained before the world and to our glory. And then I want to read verse 11. For what man knoweth the things of a man, save the spirit of man which is in him? Even so the things of God knoweth no man, but the spirit of God. Verse 13 says, which things we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth. Can you say amen? amen? Comparing spiritual things with spiritual. And the last verse I want to read is verse 14. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. I want to preach to you for a while today. Trust that God will touch our hearts. I want to preach on the subject of the day that the reporters missed. The day that the reporters missed. And I'll be honest with you, I want the Holy Ghost. I, nothing matters if the Holy Ghost isn't there. Pentecost is about the living dynamic of the Spirit being in our midst. Holy Ghost is everything for an apostolic. Would you ask him right now to come in and touch us in the next few minutes? 
Holy Ghost, come in and touch us. Bless us, I pray. Help us, Lord. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Praise God. Thank you for this great invitation, Brother Holmes, and those who make this decision. God bless you. You may be seated in Jesus' name. Now, I am intrigued, I will tell you ahead of time, with the possibilities of apostolic people. And the longer I've studied, whether it's secular or formal or informal or religious or theologically, the more I am convinced that apostolics are on to something. Most of them don't know what they're on to. None of us know the full power that is latently within each of us today. But I would like for us, and I believe God wants us, to find expression of that power in our world for the advancement of the kingdom of God and for the glory of God. Can you say man? And so, um, a shadow subject while I'm talking today is a certain kind of greatness. There is a greatness uh, that is what I call localized greatness. Uh, there's a greatness that, and they are important, but they're finite graces, greatnesses, like being a great father or uh, a, a provider or being a great individual in earthly pursuits. But I'm not talking about any of those things today. I'm talking about a greatness that creates enduring realities. And um, I'm proposing that those that go there are a rare breed. There's not many of them. It's a rare company. And these people are those that touch this rare world and explore it. And every time that you find someone who does that, they come back from that world transformed. Something happens to them. You know it. And I know it. Something happens to their churches if they are a pastor. Something happens to everybody that touches them or whom they touch. There is something that happens. The byproducts of having taken that journey to the place where that greatness some way becomes uh, uh, revealed in them. Uh, one of the byproducts is they have a new anointing that they could not create no longer how long no matter how long they studied or prayed um, when they come to this place they come back and many of them were not revivalists but their churches experienced what was for those particular churches unprecedented local revival everybody knows it and uh, the, the the man or woman who has been there this kind of happens unconsciously and sometimes even surprises them, this power that is exuding from them unsought. Uh, but it is, um, it is greatness on a different level. I would say to you today that I don't believe the kind of greatness that I'm talking about is possible to people who do not have the Spirit. And so I want to preach to you today for a little while about three things, or teach, whichever uh, first, I want to talk about the world from which you and I come, most of us. Secondly, I want to talk about my title, The Day the Reporters Missed. And then thirdly, I want to talk about a Sunday world. The world from which we come. I would say that when I look across this sanctuary today and see this uh, wonderful body of people, I would say the majority of you and the majority of the Pentecostals of our generation have not derived from the roots of family wealth or privilege or education. Most of us, maybe not you, but most of us were raised as what we would call commoners. And even more than that, many of us came from brokenness, were nurtured uh, just to be raised and survive, and certainly were not nurtured for greatness, as opposed to people in this world who are Brought with every advantage. You look at George W. Bush was president. His daddy was president. Before that, his great-grandpa was a senator. And on back, there's a long line. When you read about these people, the Bushes, the Rockefellers, and others, there is, um, there is a long lineage from, from, from youngest age. These kids are taught. 
You are born to be a leader. You are born, you are born for this purpose of public service. You are born and everything about their life is structured in that direction. They are taught from earliest days and given identity and so forth. This is not true of most of us. Most of us here today, at least myself and many of my friends, do not come from that kind of background. In fact, many Pentecostals even go further than that. They come from high degrees of brokenness. There's people here today in this sanctuary who are now all dressed up and they're all looking good, but who have known an enormous amount of pain. And uh, I pastor people that I know uh, know an extreme amount of injustice in their life and abuse, and they uh, they they understand that. I remember the first time I went to one of America's major skid rows. I was 17 years old, and uh, we went there and preached on the street. And I got on the bus when we left. I had never seen anything like that in my life, and uh, I wept all the way back to the church uncontrollably. I just had, it just, I'd never seen that. The next Saturday we went again and we got on the bus. I was so overwhelmed. I wept all the way back to the church. I, I'd never seen. It was unbelievable. And while I was there, I handed a tract to a man and I said, what are you doing down here? He wasn't old. He was probably 40 and I was 17. And, and, uh, I said, God will help you. And he told me about his failed business. He told me about the people who had cheated him. He told me about, I'd never forgot it. And, and, uh, and, and there are people, in Pentecost who have experienced these kinds of things. I call this world from which we've come a Friday world. Uh, Friday, uh, Calvary, crucifixion is a meta symbol for all of us that are living in a painful world. I'm preaching to preachers here today. I'm preaching to preachers' wives and some saints that, um, that have known a whole lot about pain. And uh, there's no outlet to talk about it oftentimes to everybody, but... But you know, you've been there, physical, emotional, mental, stress, spiritual, attacks of every kind, uh, not equipped for that from a worldly vantage point of training and preparation, but we have come to that. Uh, and we know about Friday, and of course, when I say Friday is a medicine, I mean that Jesus is, uh, on Calvary is the culmination of the fall on Friday, and in Him was the compression of all injustice at one time to the whole human race. In fact, in a way, he is the whole human race. And um, and uh, he experienced the anguish of the pain. All you've got to do is read Isaiah 63 and Psalm 22 and many other Psalms and read about the things that reveal the mind of Jesus while he was on the cross, while he was on Calvary, what was happening. You can actually read his mind in those in those Psalms of what was going on inside of him. Uh, and and uh, it was a crushing, it was a crushing world. If you and I cannot get out of Friday, we, uh, Friday is a world where you just feel like there is no peace and there is constant turmoil. And if you're there today, I have no interest in pointing you out and embarrassing you. But if you're there today, I want to preach to you for a little while. Or if you've been there in your life and been left scarred by those things, I want to preach to you a little while. I'd propose to you that Pentecost has the answer. If we can let it work in us today, not only will it produce a healing, but it will bring out of us that which the devil's tried to destroy with a Calvary in our own lives uh, and bring us to the possibilities that God has for us. Uh, I want it to happen. I want it to happen. How about you? Little water, bro. And so, um, and so this is the world. Uh, if you look in the Bible, many of the parables w- teach us these kinds of things, and time doesn't permit to go through all of this, but uh, when the good Samaritan comes by, he comes by a man that's been bruised uh, and beaten. That's a Friday world. And um, uh, he, he, is, he is the... Um, uh, he's the prodigal son who's journeyed into a far country. What should I do with this? Just, uh, uh, okay, yeah, fine. No, no problem. I don't need a table. I'm preaching. Get out of here. All right, so. So, we'll just set that right there. If I fall down picking it up, I'll act like it was part of the preaching. So, praise God. Everybody said praise the Lord. And so, Friday is being beaten and being robbed and being left half dead. dead. The, ho- the whole Everything about human future died on Friday uh, at Calvary. 
um, uh, Jesus is us, in a sense, and he is the human race. Uh, and uh, it's about being stripped. It's about being beaten. It's about being left half dead. It's about feeling like I'm never going to get this church off the ground. It's about feeling like my kids are never going to get saved. It's about experiencing the pain of rejection. It's about all of the things that leaders that were never prepared for all of these kinds of things go through. And um, uh, However, the Bible does not tell us how long the man that went on the journey from Jerusalem to Jericho, he was beaten and stripped and left half dead. The Bible does not tell us how long that he laid there on the road before the Good Samaritan came by. It had to be a long time. There was time for a priest to come by. They weren't lined up like in a drama. It had to be that they just came by. He laid there hurting for a long time before the priest came by and ignored him. He laid there hurting a lot more time until the Levite came by and 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 left him there. And he laid there a lot more time before uh, the Good Samaritan. It was a long time before the Good Samaritan got there. He laid there, and during that time, it was a hopeless time. It was a hurting time. He was away from home. It was a, a strange feeling to be laying there, beat up and subject to the elements and thirsty. Uh, and even when he gets found, he's taken to an inn, which is like a motel. There's no permanence to it. Uh, uh, and, and he finds himself living in a world of temporary things and uh, of band-aids and of temporary fixes. Uh, uh, this is the kind of world that comes after all of the pain of Friday. Uh, maybe we could call it a Saturday world. But it, uh, uh, in Saturday, Saturday's a lot longer than Friday. Saturday uh, is, a, is the day after Calvary when everybody is trying to have a party and trying to find a purpose in life. And, and people are trying to celebrate and trying to find something that will bring them together. And all the napkins are brought and the balloons are brought and the music is brought and the guests arrive and they're all gathered at Cana and they're all filled with anticipation. But alas, the party is out of wine. That is a typical statement of the human race after the fall. Uh, it is a party that people are trying to have, and it was supposed to be a party. Life was supposed to be a party, but there is no wine. There is no Jesus has to create the wine supernaturally. Until Jesus creates the wine supernaturally in your life, your party is dead. And so man senses that he ought to be able to celebrate. He ought to be able to rejoice. But he can't do it because he doesn't have the libation of celebration. I'm talking about the Holy Ghost being the wine of God. I'm talking about the Holy Ghost being what we have to have. I'm talking about why Pentecost shouts and runs the aisle. I'm talking about why Pentecost gets inebriated on the Spirit. Because there is nothing else like the baptism of the Holy Ghost when the church is worshiping, when the church is praising, when the church is magnifying. We don't care what the psychologists are saying. We don't care what the scientists are saying. We know what we're doing because we found the wine. And everybody that's sober doesn't understand the joy. Oh, let's clap our hands and praise Him. Amen, 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 amen. I think I'll just run my little aisle here because I'm excited about the wine. Yeah. Amen. That water bottle, you think it's water, it's actually wine. One of the things about Saturday is that it's the day the reporters were missing. The Bible has extreme detail about what transpired on Friday that we call Good Friday. The resurrection, the, I mean, the crucifixion, the, the, the pain, the death, the people, the timing is right down to the minute. When you go to Sunday, the resurrection, it is even more detailed uh, in many respects than was Friday. But there's no record of anything that happened on Saturday. Saturday, there's no mention, there's no report, there's no history, there's no news, none. Not in the Bible, not in the secular world. Sunday's a symbol of new hope, and, and, and uh, 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 Friday is a symbol of pain. But Saturday, Saturday is just a symbol of our world being in deadness. Friday, there was no peace, but Saturday, there is no hope. Friday is bad because there's pain and unfairness and injustice and loss and inequity and loneliness and all of the above. But Saturday, there is, 
is, there's just nothing. It's emptiness. It's futility. This is the world we're living in. It's hopelessness. It's nothing to celebrate. There's a loss of meaning and a loss of community and bitterness. And the world is sterile. And, and uh, people are rude and crude and uh, incivil. And every dream that people have is like a leaf in the wind in Saturday. There's no permanence to it. And every hope is an unfulfilled fantasy in Saturday. And every promise is an illusion. And right now, even though you and I have experienced Sunday, right now we're still living in a Saturday world. We've tasted Sunday, but it's still a Saturday world. Saturday is the daily life of the human race. It's a grinding, and sometimes it's barely tolerable that we live in. It's filled with all the negative after effects, the stars of Friday. Uh, it's a hopeless situation. Uh, and I know that he resurrected, but resurrection doesn't mean much if you can't get out of Saturday. Uh, uh, because resurrection is a Sunday thing. And uh, most Pentecostals come from stock that's deeply embedded in the confines of Saturday's hopeliness. We, we, we live in a Saturday world. I preached Marvin Treese's funeral here a while back, and uh, Rick told me a lot about his past. And, and uh, Marvin was a man, excuse me for the first name, but it's better for what I'm doing today. Just accept it and forgive me if it sounds disrespectful. But he was... Uh, uh, he was a man that found a way out of Saturday, and, um, um, and he, but he was raised in a large family, and his father died when he was one year old, and he had a gruff stepfather, and uh, he was playing in the bars by the time he was 11 years old. He was musical, and he was kicked out of his house at 14, and uh, he, lived, he lived that early life in the tawdriness of Saturday's world. Many of you know about that world. Uh, in 1812, Andrew Jackson Anderson, who is my great-great-grandfather, was born in Ashland, Louisiana. He got married to the local Sarah Mathis girl, and uh, he and his brother fought for the South in the Civil War. Uh, while they were fighting, he lost track of his brother. After the war, the family could never locate his brother, and years later, they discovered that he lived about two miles from them, uh, two miles from where they lived near Ashland. That is a Saturday world of going nowhere. Miles and I were recently on Roatan, an island of Honduras. The real estate guy was taking us around while we looked for a place there for an or orphanage in a Hope Corps Center. And uh, we drove through a village. He said, these people in this village who live five miles from town, many of them have never left their village in ten years. They've never been to town. This is the world of Saturday, a high a high aspiration in my age group when I was 17 was to land a job driving a truck for Melville E. Wilson Fertilizer Company, no, no kin, for $1.25 an hour. If you, if you got that job, you were, you were respected among the rest of the guys. Uh, that's the world I come from. I, I, I don't know anything about the Silver Spoon world. And uh, when I was 17, I bought a 10-year-old truck and hauled hay in 100-degree weather and I remember those long, hot summer days and the car and the crows and the, and the few hundred people in town and we didn't know anybody of any consequence and we knew nothing about the larger world and at 16, 17 years old I'd never been more than 300 miles from home and I'd never eaten in a restaurant once except when I was about four years old and my parents worked hard, my mom worked in a hot bakery, uh, we lived in an old house out in the country. Uh, in a field alone, a few feet behind a cemetery. My daddy worked at Hearst Castle. He was, um, uh, that's where his job was. And my mom and my brother and I stayed there in this Rand Chapel old house uh, behind the cemetery. And the tractor got away from my brother and ran into the back wall of the house. And then we lived in the old house with the back wall caved in. And uh, no hope, uh, no guidance, uh, no future. I know all about a Saturday world. When you read the Bible, it has a lot about a Saturday world. Most of Job is a Saturday world. A world of ongoing hopelessness. A world where stuff just keeps happening. A world where people say, I try, and it just gets worse. A, 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 a world where life is lived in the ashes. A world where questions are asked, but no one answers. A, a world uh, where Job is saying, why is he silent? Why doesn't he answer me? Oh, that I had an attorney that could stand between he and I and let me argue my case. But he's, he's silent. Uh, and uh, for us, we live in a Saturday world where science challenges God 
And uh, we say, why doesn't God come in here and answer these questions like we know he's capable of doing? And the evolutionists ask questions, and we can answer them, but, but God could really answer them. He could push a button, and they could discover stuff archaeologically that would end the whole thing in five seconds. And sociologists have questions about gender and everything else. God could wipe all of that out in a second. Uh, why doesn't he step into Saturday and do that? And the answer is, is that God doesn't speak Saturday ease. Uh, God doesn't talk to people who insist on talking only in Saturday's tongue. If you expect God to answer all these people uh, in Saturday's tongue, you're wasting your time. God is not going to do that. He's not going to step into Saturday. I'm going to tell you, just jump ahead a little bit. If you're going to find God, you're going to have to go to Sunday. He's not going to come back and accommodate your Saturday. God doesn't speak Saturday tongues. God speaks Sunday tongues, and that's other tongues. God doesn't come to Saturday's reasoning table. You must come to Sunday's revelation table. you got to learn that you're not going to pull people into Saturday. You're not going to pull God into Saturday. You insist on making Him speak your language, you're wasting your time. He's not going to do that. He's just going to stay in silence. If you're waiting on God to come down and explain himself to all these people, you're wasting your time. If you're going to let them intimidate you because God doesn't give a Saturday answer, you're wasting your time. You need to understand there's a Sunday world of revelation, and that's where Pentecost operates. And when you try to operate in Saturday, you're going to be unsuccessful in every single attempt you ever make. If you think you understand half of what I'm saying, would you clap your hands and praise the Lord? Come on, let's praise Him. Oh, hallelujah! All of those scientists, all of those people, they're inhabitants of Saturday. God's an inhabitant of Sunday. You want God? You talk resurrection language. You want God? You talk rising from the dead language. You want God, you talk miracle language. You want God, you talk Pentecostal language. You want God, you talk heavenly language. Uh, you want God, you've got to go there. If you don't want to go there, you can live in Saturday the rest of your life. But you'll never know the living God by staying in hopeless Saturday. Oh, I think we ought to praise the God that's alive and that speaks. Hey, we're getting better all the time. Thank you, bro. Evangelicalism is of Saturday. Science is of Saturday. Art is of Saturday. Politics is of Saturday. Denominal churches is of Saturday. You gotta go to Sunday to be introduced to the trans rational possibilities uh, that I'm talking about. He rises from the dead. He says ye shall receive power. That's a resurrection thing. That's not a mind thing. That's not a logic thing. He that speaketh in an unknown tongue speaketh mysteries in the spirit. Until you get to the spirit, you don't know anything about God. I'm going to tell you, this is unnerving to secularistic minds. I'm not picking today, and if you're a Baptist, I love you, but any Baptist can preach a good sermon. But they won't speak in tongues. You know why? Because preaching good sermons is part of Saturday, but speaking in other tongues is part of Sunday. And when you speak in other tongues, you lose the control of Saturday. The frame of Saturday loses its power. How many of you know what I'm talking about today? Oh, we ought to thank God for the Holy Ghost. I'm glad I have no compunction about being Pentecostal. I don't want to be nothing if I can't be Pentecostal. I'm not picking today, and these are good people, but the no-risk religion of John MacArthur or John Piper 
or John Maxwell or any of the rest of those men who are sincerely trying to affect change with Saturday methods, uh, to them, uh, God's talk is illusory phantasms. To them, speaking in other tongues is something outside the ranks of reason. Uh, they've already joined the ranks of the skeptics, of spiritual rationalists and agnostics. Uh, they fear the generation of the letter into spirit. Uh, but I'm going to tell you, the letter has to transform into spirit. On Sunday morning, the word that was written on paper became the word that rose from the dead. That's the word that Pentecost is preaching. Oh, we ought to praise Him. We ought to clap our hands. We ought to love Him. And I know that Saturday thinkers hold these Sunday concepts I'm talking about in contempt. But I'd say to you, that Sunday holds such Saturday attempts to do church in contempt, in contempt also. You can't clothe Sunday in the garments of Saul or of Saturday. This is whatever form of Christianity does that denies Pentecost. You ought to be thanking God that you've got the Pentecostal apostolic experience in your life today. Everything. You can't do it with buildings and programs and exegesis and marketing and promotion. You've got to have Sunday revelation, supernatural power moving through the midst of the people. Oh, my Lord. Oh, my Lord. I'm just going to tell you, there's no telling what could happen here before we leave. You don't have to have anything in the world except the garments of Sunday are not the garments of Saturday. Amen. The Bible says of Jesus, he was transfigured before them, and his face did shine in the sun, and his raiment was white as the light. That word light, white as the light, light means light like shining, like rays, like luminous. At the marriage supper of the Lamb, it says we'll have these garments. I'm talking about how, I'm talking about the garments of Sunday, not the garments of Saturday, which is education, and the garments of Saturday, which is logic, and the garments of Saturday, which is reason, and the results of which is hopelessness. Uh, I'm talking about the garments of Sunday. Adam and Eve, I believe they were clothed before the fall, but I believe they were clothed in this same glory. And when the glory disappeared, they recognized that they were naked. But this glory is the glory of Sunday's garments that come upon it. Today we call it the anointing. When we preach, we got to be clothed in the anointing. When we witness, we're clothed in the anointing. The secret to apostolic Pentecost. And we've got these wonderful buildings and we need them. But I'm going to tell you, the secret to apostolic Pentecost is that it's clothed in the anointing of God. That at any second in this service right now, something supernatural could break out. And the move of the Spirit of God could transform lives. And open doors for missions. And provide miraculous substance. Uh, and give opportunity that never existed. I'm talking about, I'm talking about Sunday. I'm talking about revelation. I'm talking about resurrection. And I will tell you, you can't be an apostolic and have your religion shaped in the form of Saturday minds. Saturday is a Christianity that's trying to avoid the angel that is terrible. Saturday is trying to make Christianity formal creeds. Rationality's attempt to express transcendent truths. But I'm going to tell you, a creed is but a guarded statement of that which is expected to reside within us. You can quote Acts 2.38 all day long, but if you don't have Acts 2.38... You can quote, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. But quoting it's not enough. Having the creed is not enough. What we feel here today, the engagement of the whole man, of our will, of our emotions. Uh, I don't know if the PA is working in the balcony back in this section or not. I don't see much response back there. But I'm going to tell you, there has to be a response uh, to the glorious gospel. That's how miracles come. That's how transformation comes. Hope! Woo. 
But I don't want to just excite you. I want you to leave with an understanding of this. One reason is, is what we're building here today, tomorrow we're going to, this is the foundation that we want to bring our discussion on. Saturday is a tyrannical world that holds everybody tightly. We're all born into the frames of Saturday. Both naturally and by training, our human mind frames things, and everything inside is considered possible or good or whatever, and everything outside is considered taboo. And Saturday has created all these frames. Some of them are good. Don't run and play in the road, son. The car will run over you. That's a frame of obedience that's positive. But we're all born into them. And it's the nature of our finite Saturday world to structure and border and categorize and frame. And Saturday's jealous of its inhabitants and doesn't want any of them to get to Sunday. And frames, while we know they're necessary and give defined boundaries, they also conduct requirements, acceptable and unacceptable ways of thinking. This is where Pentecost is so violating to denominal religion because it has unacceptable ways of thinking about the supernatural. This is what you are. When I was a boy, this is what you are. You're a farm worker. There's a constant push to measure, to organize, to size, to limit, to compartmentalize. There's set approved ways to emerge to a certain degree. And later there's approved plots on which you are allowed to live. And there's pre-approved distances which you are allowed to travel. And those who question all these things are feared and are subject to various devices that are utilized to bring you back into the frame or to marginalize your influence. Those who cannot be restrained to these boundaries are considered strange and even dangerous and must be watched and must be dealt with and kept in check and These frames have an evolutionary gradation. They start with being imperfect, and then they get polished. And then they get rigid until after a while the boundaries of the frames of Saturday become inviolate. And if you violate them, it's a big deal. What happens is the result of all of that important statement right here is the compression of one's destiny. It's compressed to the size of the preconceived frame and and Sunday People begin to think in Saturday frames. And our destiny as Sunday people opens the door wide to possibility. But framing reduces this destiny back down to the size of a predetermined frame, which is constructed by a Saturday world. And Pentecostals struggle with these aspects of framing. Early in life, I think it's true that we try to be accepted and we're keenly aware of the incongruence between what we feel and know and what there is to know. And the peer pressure is naturally to um, to be like others and uh, to not do anything because you're not to survive and to fit within the mold that the majority decides is okay. And I see preachers caught in this. There are young men here today caught in this. This is a touchy subject. If they launch out like idiots, they die. If they don't launch out, they stay in Saturday, which is to die. And so it's a world that requires some thinking and some reflection. And and this is not just men. This is women. I've watched perceptive wives of men who are caught in this struggle observe their man as he turns this way and that and sees his restless spirit seek. Uh, an approved escape from the frames of Saturday, and he finds none. And, and she watches him as he lives in this, in this tension, uh, the struggle to stay within the measurings that are laid out for him. Uh, and she hurts for him as he chafes at the nature of the group frame, which is to strip bare everything and, and everyone and to reduce all individuality to a quivering subservience and to totally penetrate everything about us and analyze and control and compartmentalize with clumsy, even brutal Saturday hands and watches him flinch at the demands to be parted out and categorized and shelled. 
This is Saturday living. This is the world I was born in. This is the world where machinery rules. This is a world where people don't ask questions. They just look and see what the signal is of the wind of the leader, and they just follow that. And if the leader is a Saturday person, it leads to destruction. And so the tendency becomes progressively more demanding. And we flee from the, the, the challenge to face our own created strangeness to Saturday. Oh, I could spend a lot of time talking today about the oppressive world of Saturday. But I want to move from a Saturday city to a Sunday world. I mentioned Marvin Treese early. This could be a number of people in my life and others in yours. But I watched him because he was close enough to my age that I could see what happened in his life. I don't mean this wrong. I already called Ricky and told him I was going to talk about this. I watched Marvin Treese before he had this Sunday encounter. I'm not talking about the baptism of the Holy Ghost. That's the first Sunday encounter. I'm talking about ministerially. And he was a good guy, sang in the quartet, preached. Fine man, all the above. But nothing there that had the kind of greatness that I started out with today. And then I watched Marvin Treese. It was another day of long, grinding, toil, struggle, and frustration for him. And I watched him trudge home. The path was arduous. The heat was stultifying. The house was hot and oppressive. He went in, he ate a bite, he washed up, sighed, laid himself upon his bed. He was so tired he passed out in an exhausted stupor. His last thought was, a frustrating, oppressive world is what I live in. But on this particular night, a knock came at Marvin's door. It was Saturday night. It was almost midnight, at which time Saturday would turn to Sunday. He answered, and there stood the most courteous stranger just outside the Saturday frame of his door. Marvin knew this one was alien to his poor upbringing, but his attraction to him was real. So he tentatively invited the guests to cross the threshold into his Saturday night house. Come in. But the guests politely abstained, explaining, it is true. I came to meet you. However, if I am to meet you and we are to meet, you must come out of your house. And Marvin said, but why will you not come in? And the guest said, because you're in Saturday and I'm in Sunday. Your today is already yesterday. I am from your tomorrow. And Brother Tree said, but this is the only house I've ever known. And there was no answer. And he and you said, I have relatives that have lived here for generations. I am surrounded by aunts and uncles and cousins. My society, my traditions, my culture, all of those are here, and they are the frames in which I live. What would my college professor say about you and your strange vision? But the guests remained silent. Marvin already knew why he hesitated. He sensed there's a rare door open to him, and I think you and I sense that In the present convulsion of the apostolic world, when people are backsliding and you can't even listen to anything without backsliders' spit being thrown all over you, I think we also recognize, though, that here is a rare and open door for those that are attentive to the Saturday night visitor. And so the reason he was hesitant is it had risks. To step out of his Saturday life would mean subjection to ridicule. Rejection, finally ostracization by others living their life in their Saturday political house. It would mean risk and challenge and real danger. It would cost something. His house was already on the eastern edges of Saturday's city limits. He was no longer in the center. For others on Saturday, it may almost be 9 or 10 or 11, depending on how close to the west coast you are, but for him... It was almost midnight. And to go further would be to banish him forever from the center of his Saturday world. It is a decision 
you have to make of whether you will stay in your Saturday world. Some wives will try to keep their, their husbands in the Saturday world. Some churches will try to keep their pastors in the Saturday world, and some pastors will keep their churches in the Saturday world. And others, and peer pressure, and contemporaries, all conspire, and society, and the larger framework of approval and disapproval in our world, all of them don't discount the power of those Saturday forces to back you down and make you be a nice little Pentecostal sitting in the corner, not challenging the powers that are ruling the world of the Spirit. That all is part of the power. And Marvin noticed all of this, but he also noticed the impeccable manners of his new guest. He was accustomed to the hard scrabble ways of men where when the food's on the table, we just all grab for it at once. But he noticed the genial and respectful and transparent ways. His courtesy overflowed into an ease between them, something that we have to learn about the spirit. It was different. He was non-invasive. Marvin, in an attempt to gain an advantage, brought to bear all of his precedent experiences, all of the instruments of discernment that he could bring to focus on this visitor to see if somehow he could decipher what the meaning was of the coming of this guest. He recognized full well that his comprehension was at best partial, but here was possibilities that was beyond anything that he had been to. And finally, the guest says, aren't you going to ask my name? And Marvin says, do I have permission? And the guest says, you're going to have to overcome that. You must develop the ability to discover names and identify where you want to go. Nothing has meaning without a name. Marvin said, okay, what is your name? What is your name? And the guest said, before I tell you, you must know that once I tell you, you will never be the same. He swallowed and he looked at his guest and he said, where are you from? He said, I'm from tomorrow. What is my tomorrow? Your tomorrow is Sunday. And then the clock struck midnight. And the guest said, your time has come. I believe that there are times when God speaks to a man and a woman. My wife was the best Christian you ever saw. But one day when she was 40 years old, she said, honey, I got to talk to you. I said, okay, talk. She said, no, I don't want to be interrupted. Let's drive out to the park and sit down where nobody knows where we're at. We did. She turned the car off and began to weep. And she said, I can't go on like this. I said, what do you mean you can't go on like this? You're a wonderful Christian, a wonderful mother. She said, I know all that. She said, I'm doing my best. But she said, God's talking to me about a dimension that scares me and I've never been to. And there I watched the clash of a Saturday world at midnight with the dawning of a Sunday. And the tremendous pressure of making that decision to say, I will take that step. And I said, honey, you really have no option. I don't want to scare you today, but I want to say to preacher's wives today, I'm just asking, I'm not being ugly. How many of you, has God tapped at your door about taking another step in ministry But you boo back into the frame of my husband has the anointing, not me. How many of you has God talked to at the Saturday night meeting and you said, I've got to turn over and face the wall so that this does not impact my level 
of Saturday night living. You see, I think you can be saved living a Saturday night kind of life. But I'm not talking about that. I'm preaching stuff today, I believe, that other people don't believe necessarily. I believe every man in here, every man in here has potential that is so far beyond where you are. So far beyond where you are. But you've convinced yourself that I'm not that kind of man. I don't have that kind of background. I don't have that kind of this or that. I don't have that kind of strength. You've convinced yourself by Saturday frames that it can't be bigger than it is or better than it is or more fulfilling than it is. But I believe, I believe that the Spirit today is talking to us at Saturday at midnight about leaving that world and stepping across the threshold at Arkansas State Camp Meeting in 2011 and saying, God, I am coming to break through to my Sunday. And I'm just going to tell you one of the Saturday night ways of marginalizing this kind of preaching. I preached this way years ago, not this message. And I remember when I got through, I felt a compulsion. And there was a whole lot of really, really prominent apostolic leaders there. When I got through preaching, it wasn't far from my house. I told my wife, let's go, I'm going home. And I went home because I knew <laughs> what's going to happen is I'm going to go down to the basement and we're going to eat. And the marginalization process of soft, derisive humor is going to begin. Oh, Brother Nate, do you really think that the... And all of the humor, when you take holy and sacred things like commitment, and you subject them to contemptuous humor, you have diffused from them the sacred elixir that gives them their power. And the contemptuous humor of this generation's apostolic Pentecost makes me sick. And it makes you powerless. Because you conceptualize everything that has the ability to take you to the other side. You've drawn the power of faith to impregnate those scriptural moments and times and statements. And you've left them sterile. And like Michael, they will be barren of the things I'm preaching about. Somebody says, well, you won't get to preach again. I'm going to tell you, when you're 65, you don't give a rip whether you get to preach again. So you can just cut that bit. And finally, Marvin says, okay. What is your name? And he feels himself being swept out the door. Into a new world as he hears the reply. My name is Revelation of Infinite Possibility. And that's where I'm taking you to in this Sunday world. And he swept off his feet and out the small door because those doors are almost always small. And they close quickly. Could it be? that this moment is one of those doors. And with lightning speed, he is snapped out of his Saturday frame. And terrified, he surely cries, Where are we going? Where are we going? And his flying guest replies, We're going to the world of the infinite. We're going to the world of Sunday. It's a cosmic world. I'm going to show you the universe. 
Byron says, but is there danger? He says, yes. I will show you Satan and angels and God himself and others that stand by. Zechariah 3.8. Is there any further danger? Yes. Many that leave their Saturday world get sidetracked and never get back. It's easy to lose one's way when you live outside of the borders of the accepted frames of finite Saturday. Myron says, I, I don't want to lose my way. How can I avoid such a terrifying end? His guide says, do you know how to use a compass? Iron says, yes, I've used one many a stormy night while coon hunting. The guest says, good. I hate bringing those that don't know how to use a compass. They lose direction. They never get back. Furthermore, Marvin, never play with a compass. Your life and the lives of those you lead depend on the compass. And the compass of apostolic doctrine is never wrong. You know, I project that in ten years, what we now know as the apostolic movement will still preach Acts 2.38. But much of it will preach it that it's good, but it's not essential. That's because you don't, when the compass says true north, you don't believe it. Why would I believe somebody in the 15th or 16th century about how to be saved when God gave the keys to a man named Peter and he told me explicitly in Acts 2.38, I don't care what the whole world believes. I don't care what the Saturday world has invented. Why would I believe anything except what the man with the compass said? And he said, where are you taking me? Where are you taking me? He said, I'm taking you south of the past. I'm taking you north of the future. He says, what are the greatest thing you're going to show me? And his guest says, the greatest thing I'm going to show you is I'm going to show you yourself in the image of God what you really look like from God's perspective. Gideon in the barrel, threshing wheat, terrified, least in his family, a nobody. Angel comes, speaks to him and says, Gideon, thou mighty man of valor! The difference is how Gideon saw himself because of the reality of Saturday frames uh, as opposed to how God saw him as a mighty man of valor. When you're raised uh, in a hard scrabble upbringing uh, in the deep south of the far west or somewhere else uh, and you're not a person that ever had all of the stuff that other people have as trappings in their life, it's easy to think that that Saturday frame is what you are. But somewhere there has to come a midnight where you say, I'm not going to stay with that frame. I'm going to pick up the resurrection supernatural power of Sunday morning and I'm going to go out there and find out what I really am in the image of God, not in the image of my upbringing. Come on, let's ask God to help us. So Marvin sailed, this new world would never be the same, nor would we who knew him. When he got back, he beckoned us, come with me, I'm taking you to Sunday. His church grew as a byproduct. He never had revival like that before. I mean, he had a good church. He's a good man. He never had revival like that before. It wasn't a matter of just learning Greek, Hebrew, and foreign languages and all that. No, no. No, no. all of that was kind of peripheral stuff. It went out. 
He still ate dinner with Betty. He still patted little Ricky on the head. He still told Paula how pretty she was. He still pastored his church. He still went to conference. But he was gone. While others were terrified of going, he went. While others were spending their lives frame building more constructs of control, he was escaping to the rare air. I'm going to close. One day, Sunday's guide found me on a late Saturday night, slouching along, heading towards a limited, faded, pastel horizon, locked in harsh, cruel Saturday frames. People like Marvin, Lee Muncy, who many of you don't even know, Verbal Bean, Albert Cagle, Clyde Haney, John Eckstead, in 10 minutes while taking him to the post office, went and opened the door and said, come with me. I'll introduce you to my guide. They led me to the guide, courteously introduced me, and said, Son, this is my friend. His name is Revelation of Infinite Possibility. And I said, in my uncouth, country boy way, Oh boy! Let's get it! And with coarse hands, I reached to grab. But they pushed me back. And they said, boy, mind your manners. You can talk, but you must not be prolix. Where you're going is a world of courtesies. And where courtesies reign, a vital distance is kept. It's not the ruthless world of politics that you've known. A certain reserve persists. Where boors eat with their hands, revelation minds his utensils. I said, is this why politics receives no invitation? They said, Precisely. Because there are cardinal discretions in any encounter with revelation and the infinite. You can't march in with hobnail boots. In the world of revelation, everything is not naked. There's always more. The ark of revelation that you experience stands on an undisclosed foundation of more. Stop, Moses. Come no closer, boy. Furthermore, get your shoes off. You're on holy ground. If you are going to inhabit the world of infinite possibility, you always do it tentatively. You never own it. You remember that. And furthermore, don't ask my name again. For you, close enough as I am that I am. Don't try to get any closer. There's always something left. Understanding is patiently won, but is at all times provisional. There's always more. When people go to a Sunday world, a control of a rather rare order is demanded to be able to lucidly communicate that to others. To witness such incredible strength and not be destroyed by it. To communicate the knowable ramifications of such revelation and infinite. Where could the, where can, where will 
the apostolic movement go in the next decade? I'm not looking at the wreckage. I am looking at the possibility that is poised, waiting for the gun to sound. And we're off and running in a world of vast opportunity, greater than any of us have ever seen. That's where we're at. Shall we stand? So, Sunday is anarchic to everything Saturday. You can't be a good Baptist and be a Pentecostal apostolic. Let me say that again. You can't be a good Methodist and be a Pentecostal apostolic. And all the Johnny-come-lately boys that are trying to fuse the two are caught in a Saturday time warp that has little or no understanding of Sunday because you can't get to Sunday without resurrection and resurrection is supernatural. The entry door to Sunday is the supernatural. The entry door to Sunday is resurrection. The entry door to Sunday is revelation. The entry door to Sunday is opening yourself to possibilities that leave you without rational Saturday ground to run back to and hide in in case Sunday fails. The Bible says speaking in tongues is speaking mysteries. That's not acceptable to denominal Christianity. They're caught in the language of Saturday, the language of Babel. We're caught in the language of Sunday, the language of Pentecost. And today, I prayed and I said, God... If there's one man or one woman in that building that is ready and recognizes that it's midnight, it'll be worth everything. Because one person that gets that kind of breakthrough affects their whole world. I wonder today... I wonder today, will Pentecost wander off in the wasteland of Saturday? Or are there some people here today that say, I'm not only going to hold the creeds. I'm telling you folks, that's not enough. You've got to go there. But I am going to have that dynamic power work in my city my family, my marriage, my individual life, my church, my missions endeavors, my relationships, my fellowship, my doctrine. God, for me, it's Saturday night at midnight and I'm coming into Sunday where there's revelation, where there's power, where there's victory. If there really is somebody that feels that way today. Movement as an act of faith has its own power. And you say, God, Saturday will control me no more. Saturday's frames are not going to control my ministry any longer. Send the guide. Send the guide. Take my hand. I want more. And I want real power. I don't want any counterfeits. I feel you hear Jesus touching me today. 
I feel you, Jesus, here touching me today. I feel you here, Jesus, touching me today. I feel you here, Jesus, touching me today. Saturday night, there's some breakthroughs. Don't 